chapter in full. I know you have the translation, the NIV translation, right? Uh, this, is, this is the Bible that you have, right, on your pews? Yeah. Let me pull out the same, the same translation. Until she finds it. 
And when she finds it, she calls her friends on the phone. No, no, it doesn't say that. Sorry. <laughs> she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The parable of the lost son. And Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set up for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am, starving to death? I will set, up, set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. <coughs> Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, fatted calf, fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, You are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and it is found. This is the word of the Lord. And we believe, right? Amen. We believe this word. I would like to call this sermon. Today, I would like to call it an unfamiliar territory of grace. Unfamiliar territory of grace. And the reason I decided to talk about this, uh, title it this way, because this story is very familiar to us, right? Probably you've heard the term prodigal, <laughs> prodigal story, lost sheep, you know, somewhere, maybe we saw a movie or read something, or maybe some of us have been in that place, or maybe, or maybe at least felt that way. And uh, the more we something know, actually, I believe, in time, it becomes less familiar. 
And, and the context of this chapter is really about the fact that people wanted to be with Jesus. And they were like sitting with him, eating with, with him, people like the Bible calls tax collectors and sinners. They were notorious sinners. They were not like good sinners. Okay? Just think of a bad sinner. Can you think of one? These are folks that were like around Jesus at his table. So the religious, the good people, look at all of this, they look at Jesus, they look at these sinners, and they don't understand. They don't understand this puzzle, how that Jesus and sinners are together. This is not from the same puzzle, okay? You understand? So they were quite angry, because during those times, if you were a rabbi, a teacher, you were surrounded with good people, okay? So that was very unconventional, that Jesus would be with bad people. And sort of, he kind of got that kind of reputation, that you know, some were really like bad people were hanging out with Jesus. Just imagine, you know, if a... Uh, Somebody from mafia, Russian mafia, <laughs> you know, would be hanging out with some good people. You would think, now these people, they don't come together. And because these folks saw that, and they were angry, good, righteous people, the religious people, they saw that Jesus told these three parables about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and also about a loving father or a prodigal son. And the first story is really, I mean, it's kind of hard to maybe fully imagine that because none of us probably own any sheep here, right? But how many of you own an animal, a pet at home? Anybody? Okay. What, what happens when you lose your lovely pet, lovely, lovely animal, that like kind of just a part of your life, and one day it's, it's gone, she's gone. What do you do? Do you say, oh, it's just another day, I'm going to sip my coffee, right? You're going to do something, right? And what we usually do, you know, we, we print out a poster, and you see people, they're putting the poster of their lovely pet. And maybe, maybe somebody here lost a pet. I'm sorry if this happened to you. But if this happened, you put the, the picture and you want everybody to see that you lost something. Something very dear to your heart. And some people say, oh, just, this is just a pet. But what, what does that mean to you, this pet? That's just a part of my family. This is my fa member of my family. We used to own a cat back in Russia. You know how many years it was with us? For 17 years. And the name of the cat was Jerusalem. <laughs> and then that, that animal, it just was a part of our animal. And the shepherd who lost one sheep, I mean, he has hundred. He has one hundred. I mean, just losing one sheep, it's okay, you know. That kind of would you say that if you, if you lose your pet, you think, oh, just another pet, I'll have another one. No. You're going to go to all your neighbors. You're going to ask, have you seen my pet? And this is, this is how the shepherd is attached to a sheep. Because the sheep knows even the voice of a shepherd. And when it says, when the, when, when the shepherd finds his sheep, he puts it on his shoulders and goes to the neighbors and calls everybody because this is a celebration. And he even leaves, it says, 99 out in the open just to go get the lost one. And as you know, my friends, maybe from, you know, study or heard somewhere, you know, sheep are pretty dumb animals. They, they get lost so easily. 
It's like I just saw like a little video of a, of a, of a shepherd, you know, the, the, the sheep was in the rut, and the, and the shepherd kind of helped the, the sheep get out of the rut, and the, and the sheep just jumped out so happy and, and, and just so joyful, and it jumped over and got back in the same rut. And it was so, like, so, it was so funny, but it's so typical of us, right? I mean, I don't like to be compared to some dumb sheep, but this is who we are, my friends. Don't we get into the same rut all the time? Can you, can I hear amen? Amen. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to, like, be, you know, say something bad about us, but this is a reality. And our shepherd knows about this. And when he finds his sheep, he is not scolding the sheep, or he's you know trying to make it feel worse, or abuse it in some way, or puts it like in a certain separate corner or on the last row of the church. Learn the lesson. No, he puts it on his shoulders. What is he saying? You are my sheep. You may be dumb, but you're mine. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. You know, sometimes I feel it's so dumb. <coughs> I told my wife yesterday, honey, you're so lucky to have it. <laughs> and she told me, I'm, you're lucky to ha- uh, I'm lucky to have you, you're lucky to have me. I mean, sometimes I feel so dumb. I'm just wondering, you know, why, why does my wife love me still? It's a mystery to me. You know, God loves us. Our shepherd loves us. Jesus Christ loves us. And it's just, it may sound just like words, but then it says in, in John chapter 10 that our shepherd, he laid down his life. Of the sheep. It's like the shepherd, the shepherd, he, the one who is the, the, the king, the, the God of the universe, we have to be accountable to him, we have to obey him, but then he goes first and lays his life down for us, for you and for me, for this dumb sheep. And he wants to carry him, and he is rejoicing. And he says, he rejoices. Over one sinner who repents. This is our shepherd. Then the next story. Just picture of a woman. As it says, Jesus is saying, or a woman. Imagine a woman who had ten silver coins. How many of you here in this room have any ten silver coins in your or your home? Probably none, right? Maybe some, I don't know, maybe a ring or some kind of uh, earrings, beautiful earrings. But uh, according to those times, the value of what she had compared to today's time probably cost about $1,200 of one coin. I mean, when I read that story, oh, she lost a coin. Okay, it's like you lost a quarter at home. What are you going to do? Are you going to be like, Oh, where is my quarter? Right? You're not gonna you're not gonna worry about a quarter lost. But this woman lost something so valuable. She was sweeping the whole house. I mean, when was the last time you were sweeping your whole house? Like like to not to make it clean, but to find something, right? It was something valuable. And if you lost maybe a ring, like let's say like a, a diamond ring, what what would you say? Oh, a diamond ring. I have another one in my in my closet. <laughs> no, I have just this one. This is very valuable. Maybe it came from my grandmother, or you know, from grand grandmother. I cannot afford to lose it because it's so valuable. <laughs> that coin is, was valuable. It was just one of ten. And no matter where it was lost, it did not lose its value. Isn't that amazing? You may feel like you're like a 
water. You might feel I'm so, and I'm so unworthy. I'm not, I don't feel righteous or holy, acceptable before God. But when God looks at you and I, He sees something so valuable that He would sweep the house. He would find you, and He will not stop until He finds you. This is how valuable we are to God. And, and it's not because of our great behavior. It's not even because of our great faith, my friends. Because sometimes, like I should confess, I am very little faith. I have a little faith. But I am still a silver coin in his hands. And that's why this woman was so happy. She called every one of her girlfriends and said, Rejoice with me. I found the coin. And that's why she says, <coughs> There is so much joy in heaven about one sinner who repents. There is something about God when He sees a broken heart. When He sees a person who is really, who really understands that He messed up. And these sinners that were around Jesus, they knew they messed up. And that's why they were there. Because Jesus was not telling them, you cannot be around me because I'm so holy for you. These people, they were touching Him, they were around Him. And because they were sinners, Jesus was not becoming less holy and less righteous. Actually, they were becoming holy and righteous because of being in fellowship with Him. That's what makes us holy and righteous. When we are in, come in contact with the living God. Because He is holy and He is righteous. And He is good. Amen? Amen. Wow. And the last story, but not the least. And this is where I would say we, we come into this unfamiliar territory. Because we come in the territory of what we really understand about God. Because I want to say this one statement, and you may not agree with me, and you may say, I am I, absolutely false. But according to this story, God is not really fair. Fair in the way that we understand fairness. So here is this younger brother. The younger, it says about the younger one. Obviously, we don't hear, so some, for some reason, we don't hear anything about a mother in this story, right? It's just the father and the two sons. So it seems like the father was raising two boys. The older one was working hard. Working very, very hard. The younger one, of course, it says he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to be a part of it. He was probably forced to work like his brother, but he didn't like it. So he says to his dad, Give me my part. Give me my portion. Just get lost, Dad. I want my part. I don't need you anymore in my life. I'm translating from old uh, kind of story into, into a modern language, okay? And in those times, and if you just can imagine, when the son tells to his dad, I want you to be dead. Dad. I want you to be dead. I don't care if you are longer in my life. Just give me my part of, of this inheritance and I'm gone. This is very bad. This is very shameful. How good, you know, what kind of dad is that that raised such a bad son? son uh, really like a, a good boy? He's a pet boy. But the dad, what does he does? He just divides, it says he distributes between their son, between his sons, he gives his part and his part. And the son says we found. Okay? Maybe the son didn't want to work. Maybe he was tired of father's uh, commands, you know, do this and do that. 
we as parents really not, don't understand why kids you know, don't want to obey us, right? We are, you know, we are so smart, but for some reason they are so rebellious at some times. I was, by the way, a very, very good boy. I was a very good boy. And my brother, my older brother, was always rebellious. He was always rebellious. And because of that, he got into a lot of trouble. Uh, and there was this struggle. You know, there's all this struggle between me and my brother. So these brothers probably had this awful struggle. So we see, in, just kind of go quickly through this story, the son just wastes everything. He wasted as fast as he could. He wanted to be free! I want to be free from this dad. I want to be free from this boring life. I want to be myself, finally. <laughs> I can be myself. I'm just looking forward home when my son grows up and he's going to be, like, wants to be free in a good sense. You know, I, 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 I jumped out of my, I jump, jumped out of our nest, my parents' nest, when I was just 17 years old. I jumped out and I went to a foreign country. It was interesting. I haven't seen my, my parents for one year. I could not even talk to them for one year on the phone. What well, we did an old-fashioned way. Letters, right? My mom still keeps those letters. They were like, you know, like epistles from God. Because I was, you know, writing her. I, it was not easy. But I did not imagine how, what freedom is from my home until I realized that I'm alone and I needed them. So this boy, when he gets, lost everything, and he's so humiliated that he cannot even like, find food. He is like, looking even pigs who are eating, and he's trying to eat with them. How many of you have ever had an encounter, a close encounter with pigs? Really? Okay. Back in Russia, I mean, on my mother's side, my mother's you know, side, we went a lot of time to the countryside, villages, and I've been like, I've been on those farms. It's like when you come to a big farm, a big uh, port, whatever it is, it's like you sense it so close, like, like, like maybe I don't know, a mile, maybe, I don't know, maybe not, not a mile, but you, you know what it feels like, what it smells like. But he was forced to live there. And he was trying to find something to eat among the pigs. Basically, he was becoming one of them. And this was so humiliating. And when he realized how lost he was, he, was, he came to his senses and he says, I'm going home because I have a dad. But I'm not worthy to go back home. I'm so, I, I messed up. But I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go and tell my dad that, please, just take me as a servant, as a slave. That's all I'm worthy of. And maybe, like maybe he was not even worthy of that, I would say. But he still went with this hope, I'm going back, and maybe my dad will change his mind about me. Not to be his son anymore, but to be a slave, like a servant, an employer. And when he gets back home, it says the dad ran towards him, he kissed him, he hugged him, and he put everything back into the lap of his son immediately. And everybody became so happy, especially because the father was so happy. But there was just one, one person who was not happy about this all, even one bit. Because what was happening was not fair. It was not fair. The brother said it's not fair because this son of yours, he squandered all he had and now he's back. It's like, Dad, what is happening? He just pushed the right button. You know, you know what kids, they know our buttons? They all push the right button and we are right there, we're saving them. It's like, 
It's all the time between my, my daughter and son. My son pushes the button, I'm here for them. My daughter pushes another button, and I'm here for them, for her. And here it says, basically he's saying, so this boy, he was just, he just pushed the right button, he just, you know, came so miserable, and you are now saving him. No, this is not fair. You cannot do this. And dad was just so grieved over the fact that his brother, you know, his, uh, his younger, his older son did not realize what was happening. That this is, was his son, and that the, the older son could enjoy everything that was his. And one thing, if you, if, if you can just understand what was really the reason, one of the reasons why the oldest son was so angry, is because when he said, I never disobeyed you even one time, and you never gave me even a goat. It's like he was saying, Father, you don't really love me. Here, here is this younger boy. You love him so much when he was he messed up so much. But I never messed up. And you never you, you really didn't show your love for me. I know my older brother feels a little bit like that. Because I'm younger, and my parents showed me favor a little bit more, maybe. And he just, he, sometimes I know he feels angry that he, our parents love me more than him. But you know what? In reality, they helped my older brother many more times. And they saved, saved his, I don't want to say the, the wrong word here, many more times than they did for me. The, the amazing thing they tell, you know, they tell, he tells them sometimes, you know, you love this Pablo more than me. Because he thinks they gave you more. And I say, no, my brother, no, you got, you got even much more. You've been saved, you've been helped much more. Oh. So, when we think about how God and how he sometimes acts towards people who are absolutely don't deserve that. They don't deserve that mercy, that grace, that love. But he still gives them. It's not because it's based on their behavior. Because if you had your child mess up, and your child was coming through those doors, absolutely like that. This is a moment of truth. What are you going to do? It's very difficult, I think, right? To determine what am I going to do when my child is maybe being so wrong. He just, he even didn't want me to exist anymore. But what do I do? And this father, he just, he didn't care how his son treated him. He only cared how he was always treating his son. And this is the truth about Christian life. One simple truth, because we often perceive Christianity in the form of rules. We think that Christianity is about rules. It's about behavior. Do this and don't do that. And yes, this, there is a behavior we follow. But this is not the essence. The essence is always a relationship. It's who you are to this God. Are you his daughter? Are you his son? Are you that lost coin, lost sheep, that never loses its value to him, no matter how we mess up? This is the un really unfamiliar territory to us. Because every time we come into the territory of God's love, God is there to love us and say, I'm happy you're home. I'm just happy you to be with me. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve this, God. But this is where I am in the need of the Father's love. And I hope you are too. That you need this love daily. And you may feel like coming like a prodigal son. You may feel like a lost coin or a lost sheep. 
I just want you to be sure that you are loved. And that's not going to, going to, it's not going to change because of our behavior. All right? There is something we know, we know about our, our Heavenly Father, about our Good Shepherd, mm -hmm. about our Lord. That we really, we never arrive to the end how it works. But the only thing we are called and compelled to do is to come. And let's just close our eyes and, <coughs> and think about this. experience that love. <coughs> Not in superficial way. But in such a way that we have confidence to come. Even when we feel like we don't deserve. Thank you. There is no shame or fear or guilt in your presence. We want to know who we are. <coughs> and we want to know who you really are. Thank you, God. We thank you for your dear son, Jesus. Thank you for giving him to us as a gift, not as a loan. There is no debt on our record. There is nothing that speaks of a debt or a credit. We thank you that our debt is paid in full. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. We can come, we can enjoy your presence, and we can enjoy fellowship with you. Thank you, Father, for being our God, our Savior, and our great, great friend. We love you and we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you.
next Sunday? Not, not next Sunday, a Sunday after. So, you're about a whole week to practice to get here early. You are really.